Hello. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Infinity in Absolute Abundance. Uh, just a couple quick announcements. If you can all turn off your Wi-Fi when you come into the sessions, we need that bandwidth for the live stream feed. And also silence your cell phones, please. And we have a film crew here this week, um, and they're going to be doing interviews, and if you would specifically not like to be filmed, then we would ask that you talk to Lydia. Um, she's wearing a white t-shirt. She will be here all evening. Oh, she's right here on the side. When you sign up for the retreat, we do have in the waiver a general uh, piece that says that you agree to be filmed in general. So if you don't want that, again, please speak to her. Thank you.
You made it. Welcome. Nice to see you. Nice to feel you. How are you? Great. Good? Yeah. Silent? <laughs> Silence is very addictive, huh? Get immersed in it. Starts to feel really good, expansive. So I'm, I'm really excited just to be here. It feels really good, complete. Thank you all for making it. So one of the most important things to make this whole life sustainable, especially when you start waking up, spiritually speaking, and you start experiencing and understanding higher states of consciousness and start seeing through the illusions of the matrix, both the man-made matrix as well as the, the matrix, the grand matrix, the grand illusion of form, of matter, of that which changes, that which comes and goes. It's very important, if you will, to interject moments of remembering that it is extremely, exceedingly funny. Just the paradox, the paradox of this. Sometimes it seems so real, it feels so real. And then at other times you'll have experiences where it doesn't even arise to you. You're just in a state of pure awareness or pure void or pure light. And then you quote unquote come back, so to speak. That's how people usually describe it. Oh, I came back to my body, body consciousness or world consciousness. It's not really that you come back, but when you have that experience, then that can get very intense again, can very dense, very real. And so it's good to insert a lot of lightheartedness and humor. So it's, it's good to giggle at the whole facade of this illusion. So today, um, I just want to give you a bit of an idea of what to expect, although it's not much because, as you probably know, I don't ever really prepare anything for my retreats. So it's just what arises in the moment, what feels relevant to the group. Every group is different, every moment is different, the way every group moves and navigates is different, and so it's really quite stale and linear and old school to have everything prepared. This is the topic I'm going to speak about. This is what I'm going to address. So again, as always, one of the hallmarks of this community is that we're not just here to consume a retreat. We're not just here to take a retreat. We're here to contribute. We're here to create. We're here to deliver. We're here to bring that energy to the table. So as you do that during the course of this retreat, I'm sure it'll take different turns in terms of the topics or the activities that will be addressed or expressed. But one thing I did feel strongly about yesterday, um, so I took a couple notes, literally a couple notes, um, but that is to go over all the main elements of my teachings, sort of an overview, as succinctly and precisely as we can, the first two or so days. Um, both good for those that are new, but never old for those that are familiar, because I haven't revisited some of these topics in a while publicly, and it's always good to get a new spin, a new angle, a new translation of that, and allow that to integrate, reintegrate um, within you, so that 
that becomes more anchored, becomes more powerful, more potent in you. These principles, these laws, these understandings, these tools. So, just some of the topics I wrote down. were enlightenment. Just to boil that down, it, what is it, really? What's the practice of it? What's the direct experience of it? How to access it? How to attain it? Even though it's not really an attainment. The absolute. Um, I'll speak a little bit about the absolute. I'll at least reference it and hint at it. I may not directly instruct into it so much. Um, we'll see. But at least I'll give you the context of it. And those familiar with it or interested can do more research. It is available. I have some material that does more directly instruct into the nature of this. Empowerment. What is empowerment? Because as you know, one of the um, things I guess that I'm known for is that I combine the empowerment path or the actualization path, or you could say the relative path, with the um, absolute path or the enlightenment path or the self-realization path or the vertical path. Hmm. The emotional guidance system. What do your emotions indicate? Because still to this day, no matter how much we address it, it's so tricky. We just forget what the emotions are all about. Testing. Law of attraction. I haven't spoken about that in depth for a while. The art of change. Shall I pause until it's figured out? Okay. Silence. Delicious. If you want me to do a test, let me know. Testing. <laughs> Sounds better now. One, two, three. Testing, testing. Yeah, go. Good. Better. Okay. I'll just talk. Give me a signal if I should pause. The art of changing. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, scratch all this. We're just going to be silent <laughs> for the entire retreat. As Ramana Maharshi always said, it's the most powerful teaching, and I agree. It's the basis, too. It's where you come from. When we are silent, we get to see ourselves, every bit of it. The more silent you become, the more you see. The more you move, the more you navigate, the more you create stuff, the less you tend to see. The more you think, the less you see. The more you quiet down, slow down, the slower you go, the more you see, and the faster you go, quote unquote, spiritually speaking. The, the expansion rate of your consciousness is increased when you slow down. And it's a bit of a paradox because if you were to look into my, be able to look into my mind, um, it's this stark contrast. There's this dead quiet, but simultaneously there's this, as I used to call it, super, accelerate, super accelerated living. So there's all this stuff that happens and that gets calculated and gets addressed and done and, um, probability and probabilities and timelines and all that. Through the practices that I uh, develop. Um, so there's this simultaneity, which again, which is what a lot of people are interested in, is the simultaneity of the vertical and the horizontal. Or the, you could even say the human realm or the, the experience of why am I here and what can I do with the vehicle that's given to me? And what am I? What's that which never changes? 
Can I rest in that which never changes? Can I know directly within my own consciousness that which never changes? Can I expand that? Can I expand my awareness of the changeless, enlightenment? And simultaneously, can I allow and not suppress why I am here, what I am, what I am here to express, who I am, what's true for me on a relative level, on an individual basis? So it's a very interesting blend, and I think it's worthwhile to master some degree of being able to switch back and forth and not make it a contradiction anymore. Does that make sense? Right? Because we tend to think so linearly. So, and when we go to spiritual teachers or teachings or even to our parents or to a police officer or whatever it is, whatever we perceive as an external authority, whatever we project that power onto, um, when they say something, but let's just stick to spiritual teachings for this example, when they state a certain truth or principle or tool, then that becomes the truth, generally. People start to take that on as the truth. Um, and then if that same source, seeming source, if that same vehicle, in this case my body, says something that seems to oppose what was just spoken, a paradox gets created, confusion, contradiction, and usually some form of self-judgment or negative confusion. And so part of, part of what I'm here to demonstrate, part of the purpose behind this incarnation of this vehicle, this thing, this beautiful, weird, silly mechanism that's here, that's channeling the information, is to demonstrate the paradox that you cannot land on any conclusion without greatly limiting yourself, without greatly restricting the flow of consciousness, the flow of creation, the flow of the Creator and the love that you are able to recognize in self and other self and express to self and other self. As soon as I come to a conclusion or opinion about you, I create a separation that I've created. It's a man-made separation. And it's not pleasant. The more sensitive you become, the more everything starts hurting. Everything that humans consider normal starts hurting. At least this has been my experience. Don't just blindly take that on, but it may also be your experience. The more sensitive you become, you will find that you start feeling everything. You start knowing, sensing, seeing, not knowing everything, but you start sensing everything. You become really highly sensitive. It's like a mirror with no distortions. It reflects very accurately what's in the field. And when I say what's in the field, I just mean what shows up in the space that you're present to, right? So if I say one thing, if I say there is no personal self, there actually is no ego, there never was an ego, there never was a separate you. The individual is not real. There is only awareness, and that awareness carries with it a knowledge, if you will, an imprint or a vibration of unconditional love and light. Light not being physical light, but the light of manifestation, the light which enables perception, the light which enables appearance. What's appearance? It's experience. What's appearance? It's perception. Right now, all you have to go on is perception. You don't perceive anything outside of your perception. Makes sense. Otherwise, it'd be part of your perception. So, to investigate into the nature of this perception is what the ancient tra traditions, or at least the inner core of the spiritual teachings, have always aimed to decipher, to experientially decipher, which is very different than thinking about it. Thinking about it is a good avenue into it. But experientially decipher, it's to be with something, to become present with something until its secrets are revealed. And the beautiful thing you will realize, the more that you experientially investigate for yourself, not by anyone's standards, for yourself out of your own curiosity, for what is the nature of perception? Why am I here? What is this? And again, things get a little silly, things get a little weird. But also part of the teaching then is to have 
mechanisms, tools, or understandings in place that give you a new context to be able to experience these new challenges or new paradoxes from a backbone, a background understanding, a context that makes sense because that's never taught in school or high school, you know, or college. You don't get taught spiritual understanding. You don't get taught how creation works. What is energy? How does energy operate? What's beyond energy? What is consciousness? What's the nature of perception? You don't learn these valuable things. We're only content oriented in our society. We're only content oriented. If you're only content oriented, you will never know what you are. Because you're not content. Content is known by you, right? Content's the appearances, it's the objects, it's the contents of your perception. You could say in a very inaccurate way, or an analogy that you are the container for all contents of life, or you could say your life if you wanted to. But even your life is a denomination, is a artificial construct that we have to mentally create. It's not actually here. You can't find the separation between me or other. It's completely another piece of content that just looks like a law, or it looks like it shapes your experience, and it does. It shapes the content but it's another piece of content that shapes the content or the way you experience the contents of your life. If you could dissolve all these man-made illusions, a most miraculous, beautiful occurrence occurs, which is not really an occurrence because it doesn't happen. It's not an event. An event would be content. If you can rest, if you can relax all focus on content, that's amazing. <laughs> Love, lucidity, clarity, knowledge, not knowledge that's content oriented, the subject knowledge, knowledge of the subject, knowledge of the container that is life itself starts to shine through the back door of mind. So rest the mind, relax the mind. It's always focused on objects. It's always creating more content. That's why silence is so powerful. Because you cannot escape silence. You cannot avoid silence. I mean, you can, but here it's more difficult. If everyone becomes really quiet, all you're left with is the contents of your mind, which are man-made. Man-made! Guess the percentage of this creation that is man-made. And now investigate the percentage of time you spend on that percentage. So you spend 100% of your time on 0 .000 billions of zeros, 1% of creation. And you call that reality. And you fuzz about it like your ass is on fire and you have no context. You're not expanded. You forgot everything about what you are. What if what you are cannot be separated from the deepest, most profound level of existence? How could it after all? Where did you come from? Do you remember coming from outside of existence? Hey, I'll wander into existence, see what it's like over there. No, you can't separate, you can't escape existence. Try to find a place where existence is not. Try to find an emotion where existence is not. Try to find a thought where existence is not. Try to find a location, a space, a place, an interaction with another person where existence does not exist. Try to find any experience in your past where there was not existence. 
where he didn't exist. To put it simply, where there was no isness, where life suddenly did not exist. You can't find it. So you see, you are existence. You can't separate yourself out from it, and yet you try very hard. Whereas when you stop that attempt, watch what happens. This silent stream of divine awareness enters your heart, your field, your consciousness. This cannot really be described in any terms known to our Western civilization. We don't have the vocabulary for it. If you go to India, you have the vocabulary for it. If you go to Tibet, you have the vocabulary for it. Here in the West, we've lost all vocabulary for everything that matters. What we do every day is try so hard to build a country with our own lives. What we do, we try so hard to build a country without a constitution. Without anything to constitute it with. Without anything to base it on. We just run around like chickens. running from object to object to object to object to object, never questioning, who am I? And when we do question, who am I, it doesn't get beyond the filter, the habit, the conditioning of what Western society thinks self-discovery looks like. Which is, who am I? It's like, oh, what do I want to become? Do I want to become an airliner pilot, or a dentist, or a lawyer? We call that self-discovery, and I'm not negating it. It's a part of self-discovery. It's a part of, or rather, self-expression. And self-expression is always amplified and purified and crystallized, as I usually use that word. It's a crystallization. Something that's malleable and vague and abstract is crystallized. It becomes pristine, and it starts reflecting, refracting refracting the light of the Creator, which is you, the, the subject, consciousness, that pure I exist within you, starts to be refracted in a beautiful pattern, like shining light through a diamond. It makes this beautiful, super unique pattern on the wall of perception of life. Anytime you dig deeper into the who or what am I, that malleability of you as an individual expression of God, of the Creator, of creation, of Source, becomes more crystallized, takes on a shape, a form, a way, a method, a uniqueness. And that's the beauty of the illusion of individualization from the point of view of Source, which is not individualized. It is. It's all that is. It's all encompassing. It's ever-present, it's non-linear, it's infinite, it's timeless. And from that arises the dream inside of consciousness, the dream, the illusion of individuation. Enlightenment or self-realization is the path retracing those steps, those man-made steps, until one finds experientially, instinctively, intuitively, meditatively the source of one's being, which is transpersonal. In that state, if you want to call it a state. It's not really a state, it's what you are. Everything else is a state. Every state appears inside of what you are, which is that formless subject that cannot be found, yet it can be discovered, can be experienced directly, because it's always here. Without that, you would not have an experience. You would not hear me talk. Every time you dig deeper into that, the crystallization of who you are meant to be, what's the unique pattern in this unified blanket of creation, out of which you are an expression, is aligning itself with the natural order of things. You start dancing in harmony with nature, with Tao. You become a natural Taoist.
Everything does this in nature. As a plant sprouts and grows, there is that beautiful, unique expression of the individuation, individuation but it's never, it never develops a mind of its own and then fights to protect it to the end and then separates itself and starts thinking that it knows better than the entire wholeness of creation, of isness. When that does happen, we call it cancer. Literally, that's what happens and we call it cancer. Because those creatures that make up our body are second density beings. They're creatures, cellular life forms. They reflect its host. Its host is you, your consciousness, how you manage your energy, so to speak, how you choose what you are, what you're focused upon. Focus excessively upon egotistical patterns and intentions and you will walk out of harmony with Tao, with nature. Do that long enough, do that hard enough and that too gets crystallized in the form of your body. Now there's other reasons for such illnesses as well. There's other purposes behind it, but that's one manifestation that I've witnessed. It's the stubbornness and the frustration and the anger and the hatred of the ego effect that takes hold of the host that then crystallizes itself in the body in the form of cancerous growth, for example. It can also have other manifestations, obviously. But this body is entirely an expression of what we, what we are, what we are here to learn, but also how we have aligned ourselves with who we are. It takes on that form. But when we relax our focus and content, Instantly, watch what happens. When you re just relax your focus, which is actually a way to focus. Relax your focus on things. Try this out. And notice how the sense of I am, I exist. Not as a person or as this idea or as my parents struggle or... No, just purely I am, I exist. What a beautiful space to get used to and to learn to come clean into. This is the true confession booth. Is the silence of your own heart, the silence of your own presence. Because nothing unreal survives. If you become silent enough, if you become present enough, any little strain of thought that is the subconscious mind conditioned from the past or any other type of mental distortion and any thought really is a distortion. It gets seen. Whereas if you run around chasing objects, running from sense perception to sense perception to sense perception, to social experience to social experience to social validation and call it friendship. Let's go and validate each other. Yeah, great. 5 p.m. today? Great. Let's grab a coffee while we validate each other. If we keep running only like that and we never reconnect to the silence, the pure, empty presence of now, 
we're just rats in one of those, what do you call them? Hamster wheels? Or we're hamsters in hamster wheels, I guess. And I'm not asking you to stop those activities. Not at all. You're here for a purpose. You're here for a reason. And I want you to explore what that is ever more fully, every single day. Wake up excited to dig deeper, crystallize further, realize who you are, why you are here, and how you can make a difference using your unique incarnation, your unique skills, your unique challenges, which are also an example for other people. They learn from this vibrationally, subliminally, and verbally, physically, obviously. Your existence is never in vain because every single moment is an act of expanding creation through your eyes, giving to the one infinite consciousness this unique individualized illusory, but still relevant, angle on the infinite possibilities that be. And your relationship to the world of perception is a new moment that has never occurred before every single nanosecond. And it matters. You matter in that way. But just don't get full of yourself that you think you're separate in all this. That again is like the long blade of grass thinking that it's moving itself. A blade of grass does not move. Humanity is like a field of grass where each blade thinks that it's moving itself and it's judging how the others move themselves. And we forget the invisible, the formless. But an individual who's not afraid of their individual power, their individual sovereignty, their individual uniqueness, and yet at the same time does not forget to honor that ever-connected source from which it comes, came, will always come from, from which it cannot be disconnected. An individual connected in their consciousness deliberately through acts of repeated moments of recognition throughout the day of this natural basic state that cannot be escaped, the state of I am. You've never had an experience without being there. There was always the I am. That is, upon exploration, it reveals itself. Again, try it for yourself. Don't take my word for it, because that's not very powerful. Do the practice. The practice will reveal that power, that capacity, that unified field within your direct experience. It's the only way it's going to set you free from the illusions of the ego mind. And then here's a request for many of you. which is to not fall into the extreme of not being able to allow or appreciate the dance of the ego mind, or I should say ego minds, because what this world needs, in my opinion, is shepherds, beings who are of a certain level of consciousness, self-awareness, integrity, alignment, honesty, transparency, truthfulness, clarity as to who they are, why they're here, and what the nature of reality is, experientially, not conceptually, experientially. Meditation, intuition, trust those gifts. But then bring that forth for as long as you have the energy to do so as a gift to humanity. Give this knowledge. How can I be of service? Without infringing upon anyone's free will, how can I make a difference through being the difference, through exemplifying the difference, through modeling the difference? Preaching comes very, very last. The talking, this, it's at some point this will end, at least for my expression. It's the boring stuff, but 
our minds in our society need to hear the words generally. To allow the conscious part of the, mi part of the mind to begin to drop into the intuitive mind, open up the heart space and understand these principles experientially. We need that permission slip of something being spoken, being reflected to us. So here it is. But don't stay at that level. Don't make it about any of the concepts. They're just tools to drop you in. If you can be with silence, go deeper and deeper into the silence, the stillness of being. It will teach you everything you need to know. It's a far better teacher than I, as a body, as a mind, am, could ever be. It's the very presence of your existence that is the teacher. And that becomes the teacher in you, the more clarified, the more purified your mind is, the more it aligns to that basic, infinite, limitless, timeless space of now. The less it's running after it, the objects to try to satisfy its own existence, to consume life. What can I get out of life? Instead of, how can I be? What can I be? What can I radiate? What can I contribute? How can I make a difference? How can I be of service? But when you stop that rat race, or hamster race, suddenly, again, magic starts to happen. Something starts to blossom in your heart. And it's indescribable. No one can give it to you. No one can take it from you. It's the sovereignty the beauty of the inescapability of your inseparability with God. For again, you did not come outside of Source, walking into Source for a vacation. Source is Source. We call it Source because it's that omnipresent. It's that from which everything arises. You can't have any manifestation without its source. It's impossible. As the Buddha said, form is emptiness and emptiness is form. We're way too focused on form. That's why we retreat. So we can reconnect our conscious minds to the intuitive mind which can recognize the space in which all arises. Just like my voice right now, it's occurring in the space of your consciousness, which is not the same thing as the space of this room, which is still a perception, an illusion, a label. It's still a man-made idea, believe it or not. When I say the space, I mean the space of awareness itself, in which the space that we call space, the three-dimensional space, appearance, is known. But there's something deeper than the space. There's a container that contains even the container of physical space. And it's what you are as a consciousness. It's what cannot be taken away. It's the subject, if you will. Does this make sense? So the fun part about this work is there's always there's always something to attend to, whether that's not attending to anything, deliberately not attending to anything, call it being, deepening that stillness, that self-realization, that awakening, that vertical path, that straight, direct line upwards into the higher vibrational realms or spheres of consciousness, of awareness. And, or, and or, you can spend the whole day aligning your actions with how you can be of service in alignment with your unique calling. Why am I here? What's the most joyful experience that I have when I'm interacting with other entities? What am I transmitting? What am I radiating? What am I exemplifying? And what do they experience when I exemplify or radiate that? What do they experience that lights me up? 
when you experience what, do I feel a lighting up from the inside out, a fulfillment? When I'm able to contribute directly or indirectly, with or without getting credited, accredited for it, when, you, when I see you experience what, dot, 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 does it light me up, does it fulfill me or make me happy, you could say? For me, it's beings knowing that they are the one infinite creator. To whatever capacity, they're able to step that up. I am the one infinite creator. You are one with the one infinite creator. What else would there be? The deeper this awareness can grow in you, the more I experience that through my body, through my energy body, through my mind, through my bliss body. As a Fulfillment. Seeing you happy makes me happy. And the same goes for all of you in a different way, slightly different version of the same calling. We have the same calling. Why? Because we're the one infinite creator. We're all the one infinite creator. We're just the illusory aspects of it. This is infinity and infinite abundance, absolute abundance, or something like that. This is you. This is you. You can know this. You can know this directly. You don't need anyone for it. You don't need anything for it. You don't need anyone not to be there. You don't need anything not to be there for it. No matter the condition of your circumstance, of your experience, of your mind, of your emotional body, it matters not. You are the Creator. You are God. Not as in an ego that's God. No, the ego is never really real. You are the God principle, expressing itself as an individual. Having become identified with the body-mind, you generated the ego effect. Your true identity, which is consciousness of the pure I am, is like the sunlight. The body minds, like the rain, put them together, you get an effect. Call it a rainbow. But in this case, it's usually not that pretty. And it's called the ego effect. It's not an actual thing. The ego is not a thing. It's an effect of putting A and B together. See if you can get this difference. See if you can feel this difference. You don't have an ego. Not ultimately. We've generated that illusion. And I can get into the psychological components and energetic components of how that works, but it's not that relevant. What's most important is to understand that there is no such thing as an ego. You cannot give me your ego. When you're asleep, there's no ego. Does that make sense? The ego is an effect. An effect needs ingredients like chemistry like a rainbow. Remove the rain, rainbow disappears. Remove the sun, rainbow disappears. Put them together, rainbow appears. Try to find a rainbow and put it in a pot, you'll fail nine out of ten times. One hundred percent of the time. So, the ingredients being you, the real you, becoming identified or collapsed around the spacious consciousness that you are, identifying itself with the senses, the mechanism responsible for the senses. Now we're stuck in a prison of our own assumption, which is, I am inside the body. Everything is outside of myself. Separation. And now, in order to protect this vehicle, which I have falsely believed to be my existence, I have associated the I am, and I've blended it with the body. And now it feels and looks and sounds like I am equals 
the body is alive, or the body is, or the body, period. But what you are cannot be destroyed. But when it blends with the sense perception, it generates the, the construct, the mental assumption that you're inside a brain. Why? Because we're always focused on objects. And when I'm focused on you as an object, it confirms my sensation, my assumption, that I'm over here and you're over there. Smack me in the face, and I feel it over here. I start referencing location. Start referencing this is my body, because if you slap yourself in the face, I don't feel it. So it matters a little bit less to me, right? Usually, that's what we assume. If you do that to the extreme, you become a psychopath. If you do the opposite to the extreme, you become so empathetic, empathic, empathic, that you can no longer operate in this world, right? Somewhere in between there is a balance. But nevertheless, you're not inside this body. That's not the truth. That's the appearance. And I value or appreciate the fact that it may currently be your experience. But with enough practice of, as they say in Dzogchen Buddhism, rest in the natural state. To rest in the natural state. The natural basic state of ever-present awareness. To rest the mind in its original nature, its original restfulness. To just rest in the peace of I am repeatedly for short moments many times until it becomes more and more automatic. That awareness becomes rediscovered. And it starts to go through this alchemical process, this distillation process, where your sense of I am loosens up from the thoughts of the body, the thoughts of the world, and it starts to expand. And it starts to shift the way it experiences itself. It becomes peaceful. Go figure. It becomes certain. Not of anything. Not of its mind, not of its opinions. It becomes certain of the natural state, which can never be gotten rid of. It's that which you cannot get rid of. I can talk all I want, but you'll hear me. Even if you don't pay attention, something still hears me. You can say that's the brain. But you can have experiences without the brain. And the same principle applies. A good analogy for this is your dream state at night. You go to bed. You fall asleep. That's what you call it. You lose all awareness of this body, the physical body. The physical corporeal body. What's replaced with it is a non-physical body. Call it a dream body, call it an etheric body, call it an astral body. Whatever lineage or understanding you come from, doesn't matter. But you start fl flying, right? You fly in your dream. Let's say you say, oh, I had a flying dream. Well, what was flying? Well, my body. Well, what body? Was it this body? No. What body? Did you really, from our awake perspective, did you really have a body in your dream state? No, but you experienced from its point of view, no? As if you were the center, the receiving point, central point, of all the senses. You could hear people call your name while you were flying. You could see things with your eyes, although you had no eyes, remember? You had no eyes, but you could see. You had no ears, but you could hear. He had no body, but you could feel. Felt great, right? Flying. How did it feel great? Oh, I could feel the wind in my face. You didn't have a face. There was no wind. Oh, I met you in my dream last night. No, you didn't. But yes, you, yet you did, right? That was the experience. So, not to be invalidated. But to, as an analogy for the physical dream, which we often consider real because it's a more perpetual dream. 
but this dream too can be woken up from, at least can be woken up to. Waking up from it is a whole other game, but waking up to the fact that this is a living, lucid dream that we call physical reality is very, very possible. You just need practice, the techniques handed down from the core of the traditions from generation to generation, the direct past teachings, the mystical direct past teachings. Stop identifying with the mind. Start resting in pure being. Become comfortable with this until you're certain in it. And then it's a 180 degree shift in your sense of identity, your sense of self. Instead of the body-mind producing your sense of self, your sense of self is this ever-present vast sense of spacious awareness. And the body-mind appears inside of it just like I appear inside of your view. So too does your own brain and your own body. Who's aware of the body? You are that which is aware of the body. You are that which is aware of the brain receiving the impulses you call the senses and then forming these electromagnetic images that you think are actually out there. Again, all these generations have spoken. This is nothing new. I'm just a translator. I'm just trying to make it more accessible to the Western mind. But you can find this in all the legitimate traditions around the world. The direct past teachings. Almost every tradition, almost every religion, if you will, has an inner core direct past teaching. Sometimes it takes a lot of time to discover it, but it's there. We hear about all the religious stuff, and then we get all freaked out about spirituality. But if you keep looking for the gems in each tradition, you will find there's very pure, very lineage-free, although they do sometimes have lineages for certain um, reasons that aren't always unreasonable, in my opinion. But you will always be able to find the golden gem, the heart of the teaching, which always points the student or seeker back onto the very core of their own experience and instructs them how to develop a direct recognition of their divine nature, their freedom, their liberation, their realization. It's as simple as stopping thoughts for a couple seconds. Just stop thinking. Saying, I can't do that is another thought. Stop that too. Yeah, but I can't stop thinking. Stop that too. Just stop it. If your life depended on it, could you stop thinking? Yep, you could. Promise you. If the stakes are high enough, you can do anything, suddenly. This thing, you know, that you've been struggling with, like, I can't change, I can't change. Suddenly, your child's life is in danger, and you just did it. That proves you were full of shit. These obstacles were imaginary. Right? You can stop thinking. All I ask is one second of no thoughts. And there's, diff there's different angles into this that can be helpful initial introductions. One being, become so present to the present moment that you can't have thoughts of anything. If the present moment is still too vague or abstract, if you're really new at this, so to speak, and no offense, that's beautiful, welcome, you can make that even more obvious and say, okay, the present moment in the form of the body or a sensation, something form-based, something that you're used to focusing on, an object. Again, enlightenment is all about loosening up our incessant focus on objects and becoming the subject which has no borders, no boundaries, no skin line, and wake up to the sense of infinity, the sense of miraculous love, isness. Love comes from infinity. It doesn't come from a need-based body-mind identification. That point aside, focus on the body. Become so present to a single sensation, squeeze your fist, maybe. Feel it so directly, but yet keep this expanded awareness, sort of this 360 view of that experience, but feel the sensation, 
focus only on the sensation so intensely and yet notice that by doing that for a couple seconds you have no thoughts. Now here's the subtle distinction between enlightenment and non-enlightenment practices that often pose as enlightenment practices that don't do much. It, if we use this very tangible example, so you squeeze your fist and you focus so much on that sensation, it's true that you have no thoughts for that moment, but usually we don't notice that we don't have any thoughts. There's many times during the day you don't have any thoughts, but you don't recognize it. That's where that expanded awareness comes in. That also needs to sort of be cultivated. So you allow your mind, if you will, since it's so used to always having an object to latch onto, and it can't just rest in its wide open, natural, free, spacious state of awareness. Give it an object, by all means. Give it an object to focus on, but then while you allow the mind to focus on that single sensation, allow simultaneously this radial background awareness to also kick in and notice that the mind is so focused it's not having any thoughts, but you still exist. Awareness wakes up to itself. Awareness recognizes that it is aware of the mind being so focused that it has no thoughts. That is conducive to awakening or enlightening. Another example that everyone is familiar with, we call it the flow state. Right? Let's say you're an artist and you're painting. And you're so absorbed in the painting that you have no thoughts. But you don't know that you don't have thoughts. The expanded awareness is missing. So sometimes people say, oh, enlightenment is the flow state. No. Enlightenment is knowledge of self, direct, direct experiential knowledge or awareness of self. The self that is the beingness, the isness, the true self that has no form yet is. You follow? The formless self that is, that awareness which you cannot escape, which hears my voice right now. You don't have to do anything for it. You are that which hears my voice. You don't have to do anything for it. See how effortless it is? Enlightenment, just like that. But you have to repeat it until you're certain about it. Until you know, without a shadow of a doubt, that what you are is always free, always formless, always available, always the container, the space for all things to appear in. So now you can allow the appearances to come and go. While you begin to rest into something, some sense of self that never changes. And the more you do this, the more it expands, the more absorbing it becomes, the more blissful, the more peaceful you become, the more powerful you become. And yet at the same time, this power comes with a purifying energy. So it's not the power over anything, it's just the power of being. It's the power of radiating the truth of existence back to existence. What could be a greater joy than to wake up to the peace that never leaves you? the unaffected state that you can't get rid of, that's always already here. Your birthright, your freedom, is your right before you were born. It is you before you were born. Tune into that, tap into that over and over and over again. Stop thinking for two to five seconds at least 12 times a day, while you're in retreat 12 times an hour at least. Don't try 12 times a minute because you'll start thinking too much. But stop, pause, boom. Everything you think is not important, have you noticed? That's not to say your free will is not important. But your free will has been garbaged, filled up to the brim, with so much content, so much conditioned man-made bullshit, that you have lost all sense of your tr true, authentic, genuine self. So your free will is no longer your free will. It belongs to the media, it belongs to your parents, it belongs to your friends, it belongs to wanting to fit in, it belongs to what everyone else thinks of you, it belongs to your children, it belongs to your partner, it belongs to the system, it belongs to the central banking system. How is that free will? 
Do you know who you are? Do you know the sheer, raw, indescribable power of your existence? Have you discovered this? Have you experienced this? And it makes me sad. to feel, to see how little the people of Earth are aware of this. I feel it every day. I was at a concert yesterday, Eric Clapton and Santana in London, and there's a lot of people there. You know? And it's great. It's a great place to be, right? It's a great vibe, and it was. It was a great vibe. You know, but still, places like that, like I said, the more sensitive you become, the more you hurt. And I love the way Ken Wilber put this once. Now, let me see if I can rephrase that accurately. Someone asked him something along the lines of, the more awakened or enlightened you become, so to speak, the more you wake up to the natural, true state of reality, of consciousness. What happens to suffering? Like, and he said, you'll hurt more, but it will bother you less. And that's true. That's why those that are more awake, for lack of a better word, and I don't mean this hier hierarchical, that word is so great. <laughs> Whoever invented that word. I don't mean this hierarchically. But those that are, quote unquote, more awake, for lack of a better indication, that's why they're also more fearless. That's why they show up with greater courage. It's not because they don't feel with their bodies everything that you feel. It's not that you become like a robot. You'll feel more. In fact, it'll blow your mind. If I'd shown my past self everything that I sense and see and smell, non-physically speaking, today I would not be able to comprehend it, handle it, experience it. I would not have the space for it. It would hurt so much that I would not be able to stay unbothered and I would need to find an outlet for that. This is the nature of sensitivity and purification. But the beauty is that you become less and less of an ego and more and more a vessel of the light of the Creator. In that surrender, in that willingness, over and over and over again, dying into that willingness to be of service, to feel every little ounce of your experience and not flinch, not not feel it, Feel it, and yet, don't flinch. You know what that means? Don't flinch, what that means? Like, don't let it, don't let it distract you. Don't let it become an object. Don't create a story about it. Be, feel, experience. Become unafraid. That's the purification process. It's like standing in a metaphysical fire of giving yourself to a greater cause. In this case, your own enlightenment, which is a greater cause, my friends. Your own enlightenment, as Ramana Maharshi, one of my most respected teachers, once said, your self-realization is the greatest gift you can render to the world. Because that's the source from which everything will be derived. You cannot speak without bringing into that speech whatever sense of identity or level of consciousness you're at. Your speech brings that forth. Your energy field, your aura, will come from, will be commensurate with what you believe you are. The clearer you become, which is a matter of surrendering the mind into the space of love, the space of allowance, the space of awareness, the more the body-mind starts to empty itself. And like an empty vessel, it now, a different intelligence moves it. The blade of grass remembers that it's the wind that moves all the blades of grass. Now you become perpetually aware of the wind and the blade of grass. That is your role to play in this life. And again, that's why it can get a little weird, because you're both the wind, but then also there's this little thing here, this little appendage. 
this body-mind experience with the five senses in a location. But simultaneously, you experience the infinite nature of what you are, the infinite capacity of what you are, the infinite unflinching peace of what you are that has no form, that's not object-focused. You literally become the space of all experiences. My friends, there is no end to this awakening. Deepen thyself. In thyself. That's right. Drops the mic. <laughs> All your problems dissolve when you shift from wanting to be a person to wanting to be pure. Your life becomes easy. You'll feel every ounce of it. I'm not promising you a suffering-free existence. Although if you take it really deep, really far, you'll have that experience too. You'll taste what it's like to not suffer at all in the slightest if you want to ever again. But we're here, we're carriers of this torch of awakening. Don't let this get to your ego, it's just an observation. Align to it if you will. Align to it if it resonates. You're awake to a certain degree, otherwise you would not be at this event. No matter what circumstances drew you in here, you are ready for this message. More than ready for this message. And something in you recognizes the truth in where this speech comes from, which is also yourself. Because are we not all the one infinite? Stop thinking and try to find separation. You have to start thinking again to find the separation. If it's not true when you're not thinking, it's not true, period. It's man-made. It's additional. It's a perspective. It's a distortion. It's a perception. It's a filter. It's a lens. The mirror being is able to stay without thoughts. Doesn't mean it won't have any thoughts, necessarily. There's a simultaneity there. But you're anchored in no thought, and the thoughts that you observe are reflections of the people around you and they're context-based. They're based on what's relevant and what's beneficial in that moment, given the flow of the wind that blows through the field of all the blades of grass, with which you now identify more than the blade of grass, and so you become like that force. My oh my, what a planet this could be if everyone had access to this information. <laughs> I can see it. As clearly as I can see you, I can see that parallel reality. It's there. And you can anchor this in. This is my request to you. Do your best. I know you already do your best. But shift that doing your best to how can I be of service. And your life will become easy. Or rather simple. Not always easy, but simple. Less confusing. If you know you're here to be of service, it makes things simple. Less complicated. Less about you. More about the whole. And in that, you will find your fulfillment. In that, you will find your purity. In that, you will find your connection to the Creator, to God, to isness, to love, whatever you want to call it. There's a fundamental nature of reality that connects all things from which all things arise. You cannot step out of it. It's impossible to step out of God. Try it. You have tried it. It's what you call the personal mind. It's what you call you. Resisting God is what we call this is me. Everything we identify with is a form of resisting this beautiful perfection that's already here. God, if people could recognize this. Incredible. And you can and you do, and I thank you. Thank you.
Keep that torch alive for as long as you're alive. Shine your light. Bright and unafraid. And if you're ever afraid of how you're perceived by your peers, just remember the strength of this community, even when it's not physically present or obvious. Fucking love you. How could I not? May you love yourself as much as I love you, and all things will be all right. If you have difficulty loving yourself, just trust me, you're lovable. You can't see it yourself, trust me. You're worth it. <laughs> You're absolutely worth it. There's no separation between me and you. I know this, you know this too. Know it more. Don't let the mind run away with you. With all its, it'll create endless problems for you. Sink the mind back into the heart, the true heart, the abode of I am, the abode of presence, stillness, being. Over and over again. And it will create a magnetic pool that will teach you everything and more than I could ever speak. God knows I've spoken many words, too many words, in this short lifespan so far. That's why it's time for a change for me, too. It's all there. More verbiage than you'd ever need. Clear outlines and practices, it's all there at least for as long as the internet exists. And you don't even need that, but it is there as a crutch until you're healed and you no longer need the crutches and you can throw them all away. You can just be you and it'll be so clear to you what you are and that you are, and who you are, and why you are, that every question you can ever have that's context-based, that comes up in your life, can be answered within. Direct line to God, to higher self. That's what this is training you for. So that you can stand at least as powerfully as I can stand. It's all already here, in the field of infinite possibilities. It's invisible, but it's here. Make not the mistake of focusing only on what's visible, for you'll miss the magic of life itself. And you'll always be seeking for that magic, for no entity of creation can stop seeking for that magic. You can try, you can sedate yourself, you can medicate yourself, but there's something in you as long as you're alive and beyond. You will be seeking for that magic. Do not pretend to no longer be seeking. Seek that magic. Say yes to the search for that magic. But do not seek it in the visible. For my friends, you'll be at it forever with no real results. 
It's not visible. It's not part of the senses. It's before the senses. Prior to the senses. Beyond the senses. It's deep within. Meditate. You can access it. It's right here. It's so obvious to me. This formless God isness. So obvious to me. It can become so obvious to you. Just a little bit of practice. Two to five seconds. Pause thinking. Relax the body and the mind. Give away all thoughts. And rest in the space of I am. I exist. The knowledge of pure I am. Do this over and over again, at least 12 times an hour. And you will be amazed. You will be amazed. It teaches itself. It's right there. It's right here. <laughs> so cool. It's the time to party yet? <laughs> Clapton, you can come out now. Next time. <laughs> Who has something to share? if you think it is you. <laughs> Inside joke. <laughs> but practical, actually. Hi. Hello? Hello. Yeah. I'm curious about this word. About this world or work? Word. Word. Light. Light? Yeah. It's Wonderful. So I heard it bouncing around. You say it also like... Sorry, can you hold the microphone? Sorry, yeah. Like a mic, like an ice cream cone kind of? Yeah, thing? like this? Yep. Um, can you say, shine your light? Can you elaborate on that? Sure, yeah. yeah. Good question. Inevitably, I assume certain things, right? And sometimes I just speak somewhat more poetically. Other times they'll be more scientific or more like methodical and intellectual. So there's all these ranges of how we can express this type of teaching. But it is, like I said, it is invisible. Everyone knows that everyone is it, and yet it's not an object I can give to you. So I have to go to great lengths to express myself as spontaneously and in the moment as I can without mind interrupting, and sometimes it's, call it poetic, sometimes it is emotional even, sometimes it is crystal clear, sometimes it is 
whatever it may be, it has different forms, the way that teaching expresses itself when an individual is lined up to that, hooked up to that. But inevitably, there's going to be certain phrases that assume that you either know or are able to recognize what is intended. And if not, at least soak it up. Just, just accept it, even if you don't really know what it means. Just meditatively allow it to maybe give rise to recognition in you. Shine your light. Make contact with that deep place in yourself where you know yourself. And then as your inner smile starts to open up, you start to feel that connection, that certainty, that confidence. Allow it to radiate through your bodies. I say bodies because you have a physical body, etheric body, mental body, bliss body. Subtler in energy. Wider, vaster, more powerful in energy the subtler you go. The more invisible you go, the more infinite the intelligence and the more ascended, the more dense, the higher the concentration of light in that body. Invisible to the physical senses, but explorable in consciousness, in meditation. So through your bodies, whatever that represents to you currently, so first you make contact with that confident self, and then you allow that to radiate out to be it, to shine it, to speak it, to stand it, to walk it, whatever comes from that state. A freedom from that inner content smile where you're not trying to get anything from anyone. You're just being and you're happy that you are. You're satisfied, you're fulfilled, you're beyond fulfilled maybe even. The deeper you go, the more fulfilled you'll be with this. And so all that remains at some point is just to radiate like a sun, shine your light. When you are it, okay, the nature of reality, again, you have to drop below the physicality level. But if you go a little deeper, you don't quite have to go quantum or subatomic. But if you go subtle rather than gross, sensitive rather than physical, you enter a whole realm of, of information that's like an energetic version of this physical reality but it has more intelligence in it. The body's the, that energetic matter, if you will, instead of the physical, chemical matter. It carries more light, more awareness, more awakeness, more lucidity, more of the Creator's information is still there. It's available inside that energy. So literally, when I am being something, I cannot help but affect the other side of the planet. And there's been very scientifically oriented studies that have proven this over and over and over again in repeatable tests. If you go deeper than the energy level, it's called quantum entanglement. Beyond that, we're all one. There is no field. There is no on the other side of the galaxy. There's just the one before any manifestation of any kind. But the first manifestation is that Super, super subtle, subatomic level. Have you seen the movie Ant-Man? Who has seen? Raise your hand. Have you seen the movie Ant-Man, the original? Well, I've heard the second one also has it. But it's interesting to watch. It's a, it's a decent movie. It's okay. But it's fun. But then it has a scene near the end where the character goes subatomic. He's wearing this suit that can shrink to the size of about an insect. But... Um, He's got this little regulator thing, and he can go subatomic too, which is not recommended because uh, nobody's ever returned from it. But <laughs> it, <laughs> it's kind of like that with, you know, awakening. If you <laughs> awaken too far, you know, it's a little complicated to get back into the matrix. But, um, but it's quite well done because he, he shrinks zoop, to get into like super dense matter, like titanium. And so you see this world ever expanding around him and him rapidly becoming smaller and smaller and he goes through these different levels um, of, the, of the particles and then he ends up at like the geometric shapes, if I remember correctly. But it's a, it's a cool analogy and that's kind of what it's like with your consciousness. 
And the same rules don't apply. That was kind of my point. The laws of physics and everything that we recognize today, it starts to, you start to operate differently. So we are one is clear at that level. At this level of consciousness that you're familiar with, it's not that obvious. It's just a concept. From that state, this is just a concept. In fact, the concept doesn't even arise. How could there be anything but the one from that level? Doesn't even arise, doesn't even occur. And then there's the quantum field of infinite potential, infinite possibilities, out of which every other reality is born, and then it has descending levels of denseness, rigidity, and limit, limitation. The physical level being the most limited. But there's all these levels of consciousness and energy that go subtler and subtler. The subtler you become, the more access you get to wisdom and intelligence that begins to operate through you. The more you surrender to it, have faith in it, practice it. And so, when you connect to this really aligned space within yourself, all these bodies, all these levels, they start activating. All the way to your physical body, which starts changing. You know the studies where they take before and after pictures of someone that's depressed to someone that's happy? Totally different, even physically different expression. People have healed themselves with happiness therapies from things like cancer. Their body changed according to their mood, their state of being, who they chose to be, or what level of awareness they had of who they are. Does that make sense? So when you connect to that really profound, authentic state of self, all your bodies, the physical being the least powerful, but still beautiful as it transforms, as the self starts operating more intelligently, more efficiently, more harmoniously, as nature, as Tao does, as Tao is. But the subtler bodies start radiating. That's why you can be in the presence of someone who's mastered no thought, and suddenly you become peaceful. It's because this is subliminally generated. You can't escape it. This is the nature of what they, in spiritual circles, call like transmission. It's a double-edged sword because people tend to give their power away to this sense of, okay, it's coming from the teacher. But here's the great thing to realize. Is that, that power does not come from the teacher. And a good teacher, if you will, a pure being, has realized this. In fact, you're doing them a dishonor, worshipping their bodies as if the body is who they are. Because you're missing the point of their whole teaching. The whole teaching is, I'm not the body. I am God, you are God, we're all the divine state of isness. And beyond that, the one. In its original form, before any manifestation, before any sign of experience. So if you, just as an example, if you were to idolize this body, you're missing the point. And you're localizing yourself as that body. And so now you've isolated it and you say, well, when I take this body to the proximity of that body, being the teacher, then there is a power that's transmitted from body to body. While not entirely untrue on an energetic level, the projections that we have on it so easily are less than productive, efficient, or truthful with the way it actually is. In fact, if you deepen this awareness, you can connect to the state of the teacher or the symbol. This is why people originally worship statues or um, have ceremonies with symbols. It's because they're focusing on that symbol allows them to connect to that realm of the quantum field of infinite energy, and it allows their bodies to align to that energy. And so they take on the form, shape, feeling, experience, awakening, of the energy state that that symbol represents to them. It's like a tuning fork, or it's like a, it's like a phone number. So if you have a Buddha statue, for example, and you're a Buddhist, and you know all about the Buddha, and you want to be like the Buddha, and I give you a Buddha statue, and you focus on that image, that's like a telephone line to the actual vibrational state of the nature of energy that then hooks your body, plugs your body in, like plugging in a charger plugging your phone into a charger. And it charges your, your body and your energy bodies with the vibration, the flavor 
of what that statue represents to you, be it Buddha nature or whatever degree or capacity you have to recognize the true Buddha state. To that extent, will you align your vibration to that and you will experience it. This is the mechanical scientific, if you will, I mean scientific to me, um, explanation behind transmission. So, but you can, you notice this in all kinds of situations. If you sit next to someone who's in a really bad mood, really ex ex existentially depressed, if you sit next to that person for three days, I guarantee you, you won't feel as good. <laughs> Transmission. <laughs> you know, nothing fancy about it. They're teaching you depression. They're your spiritual teacher about the depressive state. So go to them and soak it up if you want to. <laughs> Come to me and soak up whatever I represent to you, whatever I emit. And you can do this with your neighbors, you can practice this with your partner. You can allow each other's vibration to amp up by tuning into ever purer and purer telephone uh, numbers. In other words, symbols or intentions. Does this make sense? But it's not ultimately over here. You get that? In fact, if you deepen this awareness enough, you can get access to that at any level, in any condition, with or without my proximity, with or without a Buddha statue, with or without any symbol that you're using to connect to that nature of yourself. If you really understand the non-local nature of existence, if you go beyond space and time, if you go subatomic, if you go quantum, if you will, or even beyond, you can get that you are the source of everything. So everything can be sourced through your bodies. then space, time, location, they're no longer obstacles to your state of being, being as you want that to be. It can still help to have a positively reinforcing environment. I definitely guarantee it, because otherwise it takes a shit load of discipline and focus and dedication, which many of us simply do not have currently. So knowing that our flaw is, say, discipline or focus or dedication, to keep up with that, it's really helpful to design an environment that inspires you to be in that state. And I like Anurag's example of the power of environment. If you're hanging out with some friends at the loud bar, and there's a sports, sports on television, and the waiter's asking, you're loud, you're having fun, you're loud, you're social, you're, ex you're overt, you're extrovert. And then you take that same group a minute later, next door, into a church, you don't have to give them any instruction, their whole state changes. In fact, it would feel bad to shout. You would become reverent, silent, obedient maybe, after all these years of church's imposition. <laughs> but the point being is the power of environment is not to be underestimated. So generate an environment in your life, redesign it so that it is exciting to you to wake up to your existence and that it would feel bad or almost impossible to not remember the natural state of existence, which is the I am, the God state, the isness state, the free state, and the empowerment of self. Who are you and how do you desire to crystallize yourself for these beautiful beings on this planet that are craving Awakening. Design your life in such a way that you cannot wake up without remembering that you're here on a spiritual journey. Here to awaken yourself and be and share that with others to whatever extent is relevant and appropriate. The power of environment is why you come to retreats to begin with, right? because the power of that environment. 450 people in this amazing space together, seven days, seven nights, as an amazing environment to be, to share, to deepen, to be reminded, to never forget someone up here that keeps talking too much. Great reminder <laughs> to stop thinking.
take some of these elements with you and redesign some of the elements, components of your life to always inspire you and remind you of what you really are, what you're capable of, how loved you are, and how simple life becomes when you ask, how may I be of service today to my fellow human beings? And any and all creatures, everything is alive. The rocks at this floor are alive. They're first density entities. This is first density entity. This, is this exists. The microbes of your body, second density entities. You, a third density entity. It's kind of funny, the body is nothing but second density entities. You're carrying that and you call that you, but really you as a whole are a third density entity, incarnate. Beyond that is what we're moving into globally, the vibrational change that all the traditions, from the Mayans to the Hindus, the New Age, the Yugas, the what have you, have been prophesizing this rapid transformation in human consciousness that's occurring and the increase in the vibratory state, the concentration of light, the density of light in matter, in the illusion of the dream, the manifestation of God, this form, is increasing, my friends. It's becoming fourth density, which is the density of love, understanding, interconnectedness, community, telepathy, communicating from the heart, embracing being of service to each other, having compassion from one another, seeing the inseparability of the whole to the parts and from the parts to the whole. Here we are at the cutting edge of this. Now people will not know what hit them when these world changes continue to occur and they will continue to occur in my opinion. I'm talking natural cataclysms financial, economical, political, warfare, what have you. People will not know where to look. You will. Right here. And from that, you can be an anchor for those people. You can recognize their confusion, have compassion for it, but bring to it a beingness that is constituted in the clarity of knowing itself and what's possible and that all is well. No matter what happens on the surface, all is well. There's a perfection to everything that cannot be argued with. And you can know this directly, experientially. It can take you over. You can become intoxicated, as Rumi would say, with the love of God, the love of life. Love, period. True love, unconditional love. The love that's a field of non-separation, non-duality. The isness in all things. You are the isness in all things. But without meditation, you will not discover this. Unless by chance you do, or it's meant to in that way. But this requires your free will to sign up for this every day. To meditate, to realize this, to go deeper beyond the realm of regular thoughts and petty concerns about self, 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 what can I get, what can I get, who can I be, what can I get, and open that up. And if we all start giving to each other, generously, no expectation of any return, because I love you, I want you to have that, or be that, or feel that, Know that, to live from your calling. What a difference that makes. What a difference that makes. Practice it here. Bring it with you into the world when you leave here. Don't leave it be just here. It would be another selfish act of us as a group. We're here for everyone. Everyone who wants it, obviously. Everyone who wants some clarity, some peace of mind, some direction inward. With your capacity to realize this for yourself, you now have the capacity to offer that vibrational space to others, wherever you go. And if they ask about it, then that gives you permission to talk about it, so that their conscious mind can also catch up with what they already feel emanating from you. And when you sit in a social circumstance, and you become quiet and so present, everything falls apart. 
all the social constructs that every social interaction is based on, starts to be sucked out of the air like a vacuum cleaner. Whoa. And then people don't know what to do. That's why I usually don't do it. And you'll find this in your own experience. It's not always safe to do that. It's not always the best thing to do that. You need to also learn to consciously cloak yourself. But it's also good to experiment with it so that you can get a feel for the effects that it has. But literally, people will not be able to talk to you. Their brains will be scrambled because the presence, the energy, the frequency becomes so high and palpable that their minds are taken over. And because they're identified with their mind and not with their true free will, their true consciousness which is able to navigate beyond and free of the mind as well as through the mind, because that free will has not yet been found to be what they really are, that consciousness. All they know is mind. When the mind is sucked out of the space, because you are too present, they have no modus operandus. They have no way of operating. And some really weird things can happen. And so it's not, it's not entirely fair. It's not entirely, it borders on infringing upon free will, even though the mind is not really their free will anymore. But that too needs to be honored. So you need to learn how to cloak when you become really powerful in this energy. You need to learn how to soften that vibration. How to think a little more. <laughs> how to act a little bit more like human and like you're seeking for validation and like you understand <laughs> the interaction that's happening. And you kind of play the game because you, re you see through the veil. It's like you're seeing through the matrix, but your body is in the matrix. And it's like, okay, what are you going to do with the situation? You see through all their stuff. And it's very intimidating to people and they feel it when you see it. Even though there's no judgment that comes with it in you, they will judge themselves for what you see in them. So it scares them. Does this make sense? So you got you gotta ooh, ease ease up on them, also. But when you're by yourself or people that you trust, amp that shit up as high as you can. <laughs> Increase your vibration, your frequency, your presence of consciousness. And it's like being on psychedelics without being on psychedelics. It just gets really <laughs> And then the sense of the body starts to dissolve in it. And if you go deep enough, just this light remains. If you go beyond that, just this empty space of love remains. Boom. Things visible start disappearing. When you go beyond that, only awareness, with no point or location or space of any kind. When you go beyond that, the absolute infinite perfection before anything was ever made manifest. This cannot be described. It is beyond experiences. It's beyond perception. It's beyond any mode of perceiving. It's beyond consciousness. Yet, it can be realized. And then what the body does, what the energy body does, it becomes like a black hole. like a tear in the veil of the matrix, in the substratum of the matrix. It's what a black hole is. It's a portal to the absolute, the infinite. It's, that's what it's a symbol for. It's what it's a manifestation of in our physical perception. But there is the metaphysical version of that. But even with that, even if you 
have realized that, there's still the play. At some level, there's still the play. And so you play the role. As authentically as you can, knowing that it can never be fully authentic because you're only relating to them in their world. Now, th I'm talking advanced experienced stuff. So don't put labels or conclusions on this. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's totally okay. Don't make wild assumptions. Just let it be as it is. But what you do understand, I know for sure, all of you understand, no matter your level of awareness, because you've all done this before, it's the play of, let's say you go and visit your parents or your grandparents, what do you do? Are you fully, authentically yourself? Really? You really want to listen for two hours to the same story you heard last week? That's authentically yourself? No, but you do it, right? In that circumstance, if that's relevant. So you play your role. You get that? It's not that it's, it's, not that it's authentic, but it's also not, not authentic because the reason behind it is well intended. It's I'm going to listen to my grandma tell the same story from last week, as if she's never told it before. And I'm going to respond like I've never heard it before. <laughs> and every once in a while, just to keep it entertaining, I'll make an inside joke that only I get. <laughs> because I know what she said last week. She doesn't. Right? Just an example, very simple example. Everyone has experience with blending in social circumstances. And oftentimes, we unfortunately lose our authenticity in that. We are such sensitive beings, we don't realize it. We are so non-separate already. Our energy fields right now, your energy fields, especially with how close you guys are sitting, but even if each of you were seated, seated as far apart as I am from each of you, there'd be one big blending. But there is now. So you're learning as a group as well as an individual at this moment, subliminally, energetically, vibrationally. That's also the power of community. Every person that realizes something makes it more easy for the other person to realize that thing. That's why if you're going through a challenge in your life and you may not understand why you have this pattern or challenge, it may not make sense to anything that you want to create in this life. Consciously, you may have an image of what you want to be and what you want to do and how you want to be of service. But there's this debilitating pattern or challenge that keeps bothering you, that keeps just triggering the shit out of you. Do not underestimate the power of the challenge that you undertook when you chose to incarnate with the parents that you did, in the society that you did, on the planet that you did for the purpose of taking on a portion of that unconscious collective, making it your own body and mind, so that you can then bring the light of consciousness, realization, awakening to that unconscious mind, make it conscious and transform this planet vibrationally, subliminally, through your own incarnational experience. Do not underestimate, just because you're not always sharing love and light, doesn't mean you're not generating love and light. Sometimes it takes digging into the darkness to generate love and light. Because you're going places that only you can go. That when you've gone there, and you've shed a light, quite literally shed a light, a consciousness on that topic, and you've managed to resolve it, even just by a little bit more. I can't explain to you how, but everyone around the world has an easier time resolving that same challenge. You've done the work for everyone. There is no separation. You're all familiar with the hundredth monkey effect? As soon as a hundred monkeys start learning one behavior, even if they're separated from another pack by an island, the other island starts adopting that behavior. Because we're all connected to this quantum field, entangled. If we reach a threshold of consciousness, of awakeness, everyone wakes up. They don't even have to do anything. Let's do it for them. Why? Because we're here, we're privileged as fuck to be here. No matter, yes, we suffer, yes, we have our intensities, yes, we have our challenges. That's what you came here to experience, because you can, okay? So love yourself for it. Be proud of yourself without pride. Different. There's no good word for the real proudness, but you can be proud of yourself. 
You can love yourself. You can be proud. Like, damn, I went through that. I feel really, I feel really aligned for doing that. Thank you, self, for that service. You can be proud without pride. Not for too long, not lingering on it, just like a moment of self-recognition. In the silence of your own house. Nobody has to know. Just feeling good about the choices you've made, even if they seem to be completely messed up sometimes. Like, yes, yes, I chose that. Yep, I messed up there. Yep, I fucked up there. <laughs> but you know what? At the end of the day, with all that said and done, I know that I'm here to be of service somehow. I know that I'm a good person. I know that in the heart of hearts of who I am, I want to see other people happy. And I trust that about myself, and I commend that about myself. I'm going to trust that going forward. I'm not going to focus on how I fuck up, except as a way to cor course correct. Like, oh yes, of course, I acknowledge, well, that wasn't very efficient, or aligned, or kind, or, or whatever. Learn from it, course correct, find out why you weren't connected to the certainty of what you really are, the confidence in that true contact with your true self. And then use that as an opportunity to reconnect to that true self, which is ever abundant, doesn't need anything from anyone. It's got an infinite resource of abundance inside its own self because it's source. And then from that you flow, you don't need anything else, you don't need anything back. Imagine not having any needs. <coughs> People will scoff at you for saying it. Because it's a non-humanistic way of seeing things. It's like uh, ignoring or bypassing. No, you can do the work required. You can bring so much consciousness into yourself that you do not need anything from anyone. I'm not saying you will not drink water or have the occasional food or whatever. I'm not saying you won't enjoy company. But you fundamentally realize and can experience at will that you are devoid of needs from others. Imagine that. What would that do to your energy field, to your actions, to your direction in life? What was that? Rocket. Like a rocket. Yes. You, you, will, you will radiate. You will shine your light. When you feel fulfilled, you spill over. Every time that you've been most generous with others, it's because you've been the most happy and fulfilled. Guarantee you, 100% of the time, look back at the time where you didn't care about anything but being the life of the party. And not in an egotistical way, but just like being really a light for people. And noticing, hey, I don't actually need anything. I'm not approaching this person to talk to them to get validation. I was so full of myself in a good way, full of my own light and fulfilled, that I actually was not looking for anyone to validate me. And I had the space and energy to give. And that made life very simple. All my complexities were not there for that moment. I was happy. Being of service is happiness to self. Again, if this world could just discover just that, that little ounce of this work. What a different planet it would be. I've taken up enough of your time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is the bar open yet? <laughs> Sweetheart, would you like to come on stage? For those who don't know, Allison, my lovely partner. Hello. So, Kayu Yoga begins tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. 
Yoga prop, and it will be in this room, and the yoga props are not provided, so you can buy them outside of this room in the morning. Um, let's see. So I'm going to write it up here, uh, the website, www.bentinobarlow.com. We're going to have a complete schedule of every day on there and many more details about everything you could possibly want to know about the event. Um, so if you're staying in the manor house, which is this building, or if you're in the campground, you're going to be eating in this building. If you're staying in the cottages or the castle over there, uh, we ask that you eat in that building, in the castle. And if you're not staying here, then you can eat at either location. The food is the same in each location. Um, we also ask that you please take all your belongings with you after each session so that everyone can have an opportunity to sit where they would like, no saving seats, and it helps us when we want to rearrange the chairs and clean up. So we have a cash bar, like he was mentioning. Um, it's not included with the retreat. It's back in this room over here, and it opens at 9.30 and we ask that no one smokes in any of the buildings, including the bar. That's everything. Thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, Oh yeah, so I don't know who here saw the schedule, but every morning my session starts at 11. The first hour or so, give or take, of that is going to be silent. It's because I'll, I'll just have woken up by then. <laughs> <laughs> no, quite honestly, it's to start the day with this vroom. Brain's cleared, sleepiness cleared. So connect, actually see each other as tuning forks, not just me, we're all tuning forks. And like with sound vibration, which is also invisible by the way, so is when you're calling your grandma, which you probably don't do so often, you, you connect with absolutely invisible things and you find it normal, right? So <laughs> trust me when I say, or don't, that this room is radiated, okay, ra it's absolutely beaming with energy, with vibration, with your own personal Wi-Fi, if you will. And um, you are like a cell tower. And so when you put tuning forks in the same room and you hit one of them, they all start harmonizing. Zing, 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 zing. That's the power of being together, holding silence with enough people in the room that are able to clear the mind and bring forth a vibration that is not of this world in terms of the physicality. It is of a deeper level. It's a higher vibration. So, and a lot of you guys can do this and do do this, and those that are fairly new to this, they'll be able, if they're just open and receptive, their tuning forks, if you will, start picking up on that. First subliminally, but then if you're sensitive enough, you'll be like, wait a second, even though I have a busy, chaotic mind all the time, I'm starting to feel something. Get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Can be a little intimidating, like I said. Why? Less so if no one is interacting, because no one's looking at you. No one sees your dirty secrets. No one sees your thoughts, right? <laughs> and your little lies and your coping mechanisms and your compensatory behaviors and the way you wink at people because you think it'll get you something, but you don't even know you're doing it. So when all that stuff comes to the service in the presence of a quiet space, just allow it to clear and tune into that deeper self. Get, get more comfortable with silence because it's the foundation for anything else. If you cannot be quiet with yourself, then you don't know who you are and you've not regained your free will. You've not rediscovered this vast, vast resource that is your entity's free will, your consciousness. You're just too filled with content 
given to you by other people's minds to know yourself. So get used to the space of I don't know anything, I'm just present. Boom. Clarifying mirror state. We all do that for an hour. I guarantee you the questions during the day will be so much better. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, any more announcements? Did I see a ripple? Hello. Okay. One last thing. I made a mistake with the website. It's www.bentiniobarlow2018.com. So. Yeah, don't find yourself in the wrong year. <laughs> you may not know how to get back just yet. <laughs> but we'll teach you that, too. Great. Have fun, guys.